This is part two of three on chapter one, the main themes of microbiology. In this part, we're gonna be looking at the historical aspect of microbiology and introduce you to some of the concepts and tools that we're gonna be using in lecture and lab. So microbiology has been built up by thousands of different microbiologists over approximately 300 years. And there's four prominent discoveries that I'm gonna look at. Um, these are just gonna include some of the major things that we use all the time in microbiology. So we're gonna look at microscopy, the scientific method, the development of medical microbiology, and medical microbiology is looking at uh, microorganisms that cause disease, how they cause it, how we can control them, um, that sort of thing. And then the fourth discovery is microbiology techniques. And I'm just going to introduce you to very brief techniques that we're going to be using in the lab. The first historical microbiologist I'm going to introduce you to is Leeuwenhoek. He was born in 1632 and he died in 1723. He was a Dutch linen merchant by day, and at night he was really interested in building microscopes and trying to observe very tiny microbes. So he was actually the first person where we have documented evidence that he observed these living micro microbes. He also built the first single lens magnification tool or microscope and it could magnify up to 300 times. And that's pretty good, considering that the microscopes we're going to be using in lab go up to a thousand magnification. This is a picture of his single lens microscope, and it's on the left hand side here. So he had a lens, it was just one lens that he looked through, and then his specimen holder, it kind of looked like a nail, he just placed the specimen on top of that. And then there were focus screws so he could adjust where the specimen was located so he could focus on it. And um, the image at the bottom shows a person actually using his first microscope. And then on the right side we have drawings from his notebook. And there's figure A, it looks like a little rod shaped or bacillus bacteria. We also have kind of squiggly bacteria and other shapes as well. So again, he was the first person where we have documented evidence that he actually discovered or could see these different microorganisms. The second prominent discovery was the scientific method. And this is the scientific method that we're going to be using in lab and then also we're going to be doing a case study in lab using it. So the scientific method, it starts up at the top with an observation, and then from the observation you come up with a hypothesis. And a hypothesis is just an educated guess to explain that observation. And these hypotheses, they don't have to be right or wrong, they just have to be um, kind of explaining why we might see this observation that we're seeing. After you have a hypothesis, you're going to do your experiment. So you're actually going to come up with an experiment, run the experiment, and then you'll collect data from your experiment. Then from your data, you come up with a conclusion. This conclusion can either reject your hypothesis so it doesn't match what you thought was going to happen, so that's being rejected, or the conclusion, it can go off to the right, it can be supported. And that's when we do support our hypothesis. If a hypothesis has lots and lots of support behind it, it can become a theory. So we have things like the cell theory that we're going to be looking at, um, the theory of evolution, the theory of chromosomal inheritance. All these things are theories that are very heavily supported by lots of evidence from lots of different scientists. That theory can become a law. We don't have any laws in biology, but if you think about like chemistry or physics, they have the laws of thermodynamics, um, Newton's laws. So those are a few examples of different types of laws. 
And in lab, we're going to be doing some experiments, so experimentation, um, especially when you do your unknown project. You're going to have to figure out how to identify the, your unknown bacteria that I'm going to be giving you. The third prominent discovery is the medical microbiology. So here we have two more microbiologists, so John Tyndall and Ferdinand Cohn. They each demonstrated the presence of a heat-resistant form of some microbes. And this heat-resistant form is actually called an endospore or a spore. So endospores are spores, they can resist heat, so they're very, very hard to kill. They can resist chemicals, they can resist dehydration. So we have certain species of bacteria that will produce these spores. Um, an example of a spore is anthrax. So an anthrax spore is one of these heat resistant forms of a species of bacteria. Once you breathe in that endospore, it germinates into the bacteria cells and then those bacteria cells are the ones that make the people sick with the anthrax. So a lot of times we're going to be talking about sterility. So in medical microbiology, our instruments, we want to sterilize them. We want to eliminate all life forms. And that includes the endospores, these heat resistant forms. It also includes viruses. And technically viruses aren't living, but they can cause disease. So we really want to get rid of them when we sterilize different objects. The discovery of medical microbiology led to the development of aseptic techniques. And you're going to learn different aseptic techniques in lab on our first lab day. So we have a few more microbiologists that contributed with developing these aseptic techniques. So you have Dr. Oliver Wendell Holmes. He observed that mothers of home births had fewer infections than those who gave birth in a hospital. So he started off with kind of this observation. And then Dr. Semmelweis, he took that observation, he came up with some hypotheses of why he might, we might see these differences, and then he ran some experiments and actually correlated these infections with physicians that were going from the autopsy room to the maternity ward. So he found out that these physicians, they were in the autopsy room, they picked up different diseases from that room, and then they did not wash their hands and they brought it back to the maternity ward and helped these women give birth. So those women, they picked up whatever was brought over from the autopsy room and they became very sick and they had a very high rate of death and infection. So Joseph Lestier, he introduced what we call the aseptic technique. And the aseptic technique reduces microbes in the medical setting and it prevents wounds from becoming infected. So the number one um, technique is washing hands. So it involves disinfection of hands using chemicals prior to surgery, prior to passing pills, um, and just between patients. So washing hands is part of our aseptic technique. So you're going to want to do this every time you come into lab and every time you leave lab. And also the use of heat for sterilization. So on the previous slide we talked about sterilization, getting rid of all living things on an object, including the endospores and viruses on that object. So heat is a really good way to sterilize different instruments. And you're going to be using Bunsen burners in lab to get this heat for your sterilization of your inoculating loops. Medical microbiology includes the germ theory of disease. And here we see another theory. So remember, theory, very, very heavily supported by lots of evidence, lots of experiments done by lots of different scientists. So this germ theory states that many diseases are caused by the growth of microbes in the body. Those diseases are not caused by sin, bad character, poverty, etc. So there has to be some microorganism that causes that specific disease. 
And the two people that contributed to this theory are Louis Pasteur and Robert Koch. Louis Pasteur, he contributed quite a few things to microbiology. So first off, he showed that microbes cause fermentation that produce carbon dioxide and alcohol. And then also he showed that microbes cause spoilage of food. And in addition to that, he disproved what's called a spontaneous generation of microorganisms. So people thought that microorganisms could just spontaneously appear on food that they didn't come from other microorganisms. He also developed pasteurization, so that should kind of fit in with the name. Hopefully you got that connection, Louis Pasteur pasteurization. And then he also demonstrated what is now known as the germ theory of disease. And then Robert Koch, he established Koch's postulates, which I'll go through in a minute, but it's just a sequence of experimental steps. They're really well laid out that actually verify this germ theory of disease. So these sequence of steps show that, yes, indeed, this microorganism causes this disease. In addition, he identified the cause of anthrax, TB, tuberculosis, and cholera using these experimental steps, these postulates. He also developed peer culture methods, and we need these methods in order to go through his experimental steps. Um, we'll also be using these peer culture methods in lab. Koch's postulates have four basic steps, so four um, ex procedures that go along with showing that this microorganism causes this disease. So if you look at the brown mouse up in the top left corner, so first off we have to collect a sample from an animal that has a disease. And then in that sample we have to find the microorganism. So you see that the arrow goes down, we see a microscope, and it has these little red bacteria in our sample. That sample, we do a second step to it. We have to grow it in the lab in a peer culture on an auger plate. So you see the number two arrow going off to the right. So we grow that bacteria in lab. Number three, we take some of that bacteria and inject it into a healthy mouse. So that's the third step. And then you wait and see to see if that mouse develops the same disease as our brown mouse. So that's showing that this microorganism causes this disease. Once you have the signs and symptoms of the disease in the white mouse, you take another sample you see in the microscope to look and see if the bacteria matches, so they do, and then you grow it in culture again. So that's step number four. So this is showing that that bacteria is linked to that specific disease. And this helps to show that germ theory. So this microorganism causes this disease. It's a one-to-one -one relationship. 